the Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guests are director Leon Katz and actress Magda Harrit. Leon Katz is the author of several dozen plays and adaptations which have been produced in the United States and abroad. Among them, the three cuckolds with 400 productions. Yes. How did that happen? Uh, it happened because of Eric Bentley. That's how it happened. Eric Bentley did an anthology of classic Italian plays, and he had no script for Commedia dell'arte because Commedia dell'arte didn't have scripts, but I had written one oh. for my students at Vassar. He liked it very much, published it, and since his anthology was done all over, was sold all over the world, the play was done all over the world. Did you go with it? No, no. You no. didn't get to go with us? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I only saw a few productions. Uh, one of them, the best of them, was with Bill Irwin. He did a magnificent performance in, in San Diego. That was really quite a treat. Well, that's yeah. pretty exciting, yes, though, yes, to yes, have yes. something <laughs> with, you know, count the productions, but, and not just in one place, all over the no, world? It was all over the world, yes, yes. Six languages, 11 countries. <laughs> so, um, you also wrote Sonia, which yes. was um, starring Julie Harris. Julie Harris, yes. Ah, Julie Harris. One of my favorite people. Julie Harris's ideal was to emulate Mother Teresa. That's literally the case. That's literally the case. It, her, she is one of the purest and most holy people I've ever met in my life. It's you mean in real, life, in real life? Not yes. on the stage? In real life. In real life. And um, she fell in love with the play when, uh, when I sent it to her. And uh, she was acting the Countess Tulsa. It was Tulsa's wife. It's a bitter, bitter play about the relation between the two of them between Tolstoy and his wife during the time when Tolstoy is dying, the last seven days of his life and he's dying in a railroad station. He, he refused to have her uh, come down to know where he was, but uh, she discovered it, of course, of the newspaper reporter, and she came down and spent seven days trying to get to see him, and his disciples would not allow her to come in until he was dying. And that's the first time she was able to see him when he was unconscious. So and is that where the, the play covers the that The play whole? takes place in the railroad station. You, yeah. you have yeah. a penchant for uh, artists and their tragic lives yeah. because you've written another original play, Beds, which is yeah. about three artists, about three really. Artists. Yes. Yes. And when I saw the production in Hollywood, I noticed this strand of betrayal almost or control of the lover and yes. the person that you had on stage. Tell us about Beds. Beds is, uh, Beds is a play about uh, three love affairs which turn all of which are almost brutal in the underpinnings of the love. Kokoschka wrote a play called Murderer, Hope of Women. He meant by that lover, hope of women. Can you imagine such a thing? But the, uh, his notion So was woman was the murderer in no, his no, mind. No, the lover is the murderer. Oh, the lover is the, the, uh, lover is is the, the murderer, murderer. Yes. right. That's and the expectation in love in Kokoschka, the expectation of the lover is that they will, that they will absolutely tear one another to pieces, which is, of course, the substance of the last play. But the other two plays, the one of Alice Toklas and Oscar Wilde, have exactly the same substance, but it is very, very muted. The same thing is going on, however. It is the story of a lover, in both instances, a lover who is tearing the personality out of the other one to the extent that they can, see, to make that other person themselves. That's I, the, I yes. could see it. Yeah. I could see it when yeah. I saw it. It was like you feel so sorry for the person on stage because they're tormented, they're tormented by yes. the lover figure yes. in their lives. That's exactly so. That's exa now, yes. How did you decide or how did you get so involved with writing about artists? Because I, I notice artists seem to be reoccurring in your work. Because of the complexity of the personality. The, there's a depth of... What happens with an artist, especially a writer, is that they have double consciousness at least. They're conscious of the thing that they're observing, the thing that they're writing about, but they're also conscious of the fact that they are doing it. They're conscious of the fact that they're writing. The same thing happens in the personal relationships. They're conscious of the relationship, but they're also conscious of that. 
They're conscious of the fact that they ha are in a relationship. That they are important? That's right. Is that, that what it is? Yeah, I think so. It's a tremendous, yes, there's a tremendous sense of the, the presence of the ego, the presence of the self. And that produces some of the most horrible and most ecstatic situations in the world. See, I mean, their sense of being in love is overwhelming because they can express it. And their sense of being the opposite of love is equally overwhelming. What kind of um, research did you have to do? Or, did this, or were these things that you had always been raised with and fascinated? I'm with? afraid. I'm afraid that I was raised with it during my own marriage. <laughs> oh, <laughs> not that part. Not, not the go. torment part. <laughs> <laughs> the artist part. The artist part. <laughs> the artist part. I spent a year with Alice Toklas in you Paris. You did? Yes, yes. Uh, I had found Gertrude Stein's note. I was doing my dissertation on Gertrude Stein, and I found her notebooks at the Yale Library. And uh, no one had ever seen them. They didn't even know if they were notebooks. They were just sort of miscellaneous scraps. And so I brought them. I had a Ford Foundation Fellowship and brought them to Paris to, uh, to interview Alice Toklas, who had never seen them. She was never, it was the only thing Stein ever wrote. Gertrude had been writing them and Alice kept, never saw no, them? No, because they were never to be typed. They were just notes. Oh, and she would type her work. She would type the finished work. I see. So we went through it for four months. We went through it eight hours to 12 hours a day, three times a week for four months. Was she in the convent then? No, or no. She was, she was, a, she was uh, Rue Christine. She was still living, she was still living uh, on her own. So and she wasn't sick, or she was no, very no. aware of what was going on. Oh, very on. much so, and it made her very happy, too. She really loved this whole process. And so every single thing that she says in the play, she actually said to me. Is that right? Yeah. It took me two, I knew her so well that it took me literally two days to write that entire play, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Just two days. And I how long her. is it on stage? And, uh, it's a half 30, hour. Half hour, 30 yeah. minutes? It's the 30 minutes, yes. And she and it's it's one person and she speaks the whole time. She speaks the whole time. And she's Is it like a to, train of? Uh, yes, uh, she was being taken care of by Pierre Balmain uh, when she was dying, and he was very very kind and uh, he had good reason to be because they had been very kind to him. And they helped launch his career. That was surprising to me that yes, Pierre uh, Balmain was yes, there. Yes, very then. very kind man. And so uh, he literally took care of her. He would bathe her, wash her, do, to change her linens and so on, and. She both respected that enormously, but was also clearly somewhat appalled at the fact that she was being touched, that she was being, because no one had ever, ever. Touched been, her like that? No, never, except Gertrude. But it's the, it's, it's, it, the interesting thing is then you went on to write uh, or collaborate yeah. on an opera by Gertrude. Yes. Does that come before or after before, this? It came before. It um, came before too? Yeah, yeah, that was the, uh, her novel, The Making of America. It's a 1,000 page novel and it's, uh, major, major 20th century work that is still being explored and still being understood and so on. So um, because I had the notebooks which, which covered the period of the novel, oh. I was able to understand exactly whom she was talking about her and so on. So I did a, um, I did a, um, a libretto for the opera and, and Al Carmines did the score for it. And we did it at the Judson Theater. It's been done several times since then. Is, is it, uh, d does it reoccur, I mean, does it keep coming up? And do you get to have a, a part of it yes, when yes. people play? Yes, uh, every time. Every, every time it's been done. Yeah. Well, yeah. you talked about being in Yale and getting a Ford fan, but yeah. you've taught, you're uh, director emeritus at Yale. Yeah. Whatever that means. <laughs> Tell us what that means. It means you've been there for so long. <laughs> I'm professor emeritus. I was, professor emeritus. I was co chairman of the dramaturgy department at the, in the Yale Drama School. And I was there for nine, for nine years. Teaching. Teaching, yes. And yes. you've taught at so many other, you've taught at Cornell, at Stanford, at Columbia. Uh, Penn, University of Pennsylvania. I will tell you the best school I ever taught at was Manhattanville College of the Sacred Heart, run by Sacred Heart nuns. The finest people I've ever known oh. were the were a, a half dozen of the nuns at that school, and the finest education I've ever known given to to people was at Manhattanville. I enormously respected them. There was one nun who ran the uh, the theater program with me, uh, and uh, we did one major production every year. And she was a superb collaborator. I wanted to do a production of Dr. Zhivago. I wanted to adapt Dr. Zhivago. So she read it, and she said, it's a poor translation. Let me retranslate the parts you want. And so I marked off the parts in the novel that I wanted to use for the adaptation. Within six weeks, she retranslated. She learned Russian. It was, it was Russian. I was going to ask you. It was written in Russian, in Russian wasn't it? And she, re she learned Russian and retranslated. She knew many, many languages. She was incredible. Um, and she redid, <laughs> isn't that extraordinary? She's one of the most remarkable women I've ever known, uh, one of the most really beautiful, beautiful human beings. You talked about dramaturgy. You're yes. the dramaturg at 
the Mark Taper Theater in Los Angeles. Yes, yes. What does that what does that person actually do? <laughs> <laughs> Is what he represents more than what he does. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what does he represent? <laughs> <coughs> I used to tell my students that the dramaturg, at his very best, <laughs> at his most useful, is the artistic conscience of the theater. Is there? Uh, yeah. Rarely does the theater need or want such an artistic conscience. They generally are happy to just schedule plays that will. But so then go. it's good to have that. Yes, it very good. It 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 broadens the scope of yes. what's going to go on stage and it's yes. also almost like the, hello the police yes. the artistic police watching what's happening uh, well more encouraging than demanding so it's not quite like police it's no en encouraging but to but make yeah. sure it's there yes that's that's exactly it yes uh, and you look forward to uh, introducing things that the theater has never done before and so on you see you know, y you talked about uh, teaching in many schools, many American schools. Yes. You also taught in Germany. Yes, yes, at the University of Gießen, Gießen in Germany. Uh, remarkable, remarkable experience. It was a, a summer program, and I taught there for during, just for the summer. The students there are, were so literate in theater that the productions the students did on campus are productions the the avant-garde quality of those productions, the nature of those productions, has not yet been done on oh, any campus in America, right? I am certain. Did yeah, you it's have... It's a very sophisticated uh, culture, theater, theater culture. Theater altogether. culture. Tremendously so. Did you feel a different approach when you were in Germany than you would have uh, uh, given to your American Very students? much so. Uh, the students had a complete classical education. That is oh, so you didn't even have to do that. You didn't have to go near that education. Like what, what, what we were dealing with was uh, postmodern criticism. That was the that was the. I was teaching Gertrude Stein and postmodern criticism, two courses, and those students. The background that they had in the arts generally, in culture generally, in the sciences, etc., is something that American students do not match. It's a very, very, very. Where does it come from? Does it come from college? Does it come from high school when they go to the theater all the time? Where, where? It comes from a remarkable educational system and a tradition, a cultural tradition in Germany that focuses on theater, on the classics in theater and so on. When I, the first day, I walked the flight of steps up to the office, to the drama office at the university, the first thing that greeted me was a poster announcing a production of a play by Corneille, which I'm sure has never been even heard of in oh, this country. I see. You see so and this was student fair. So yeah. it's like delving into oh, yes, yes, to yeah. everything. That tradition is a very, very I know. solid one. Yeah. We, we were talking um, at, at the theater the other day, and I was asking mm -hmm. you about your students, because you have yeah, yeah. a lot of quite famous yeah. students. <laughs> and I'm going to give one away, Cherry yeah. Jones, who yeah. was doing <laughs> Moon for the Misbegotten yeah. on Broadway. And you went, oh, that's Salome Jens' role. Yeah. But Cherry's the next perfect person. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about some of the other um, well, at, at, at Yale, the, uh, I didn't teach the student, the uh, actors as actors. I taught them history of theater, criticism, and so that's, on. You yeah, see. that's what But I nevertheless, I was fairly close to them. Um, there were two actors there whom I especially relished. Uh, one of them was John Tuturo, oh. extraordinary actor. Uh, and the other was Rock Dutton, Charles Dutton, an extraordinary, extraordinary actor altogether. He did a performance of, um, of Othello that I will never forget uh, on his own. Then he did it at the main theater as a, a regular production, and it was not nearly as good because the director had done things to him that he himself had done infinitely better. When he was Is just, that right? Yes. Because sometimes you think an actor can't direct himself, uh -huh. but when you have a vision, maybe yes, you can yes. do it. Well, he had such humanity. It was just extraordinary, the extraordinary depth of humanity. I, I would love to work with him again. It was just a, a great, great pleasure. Well, you're retired, supposedly. Yeah. I've never been busier. <laughs> I just wanted to yeah. get that in before we left. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and thank you. Thanks for being my, with my me, pleasure. Leon yeah. Katz. And don't go away. We'll be right back with Magda Harut. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. I'm Joan Quinn, and I'm here with Magda Harut, who was born in Detroit but raised in California. She went to Fairfax High, and she graduated from UCLA. Magda has appeared in feature films like My Life and Wired. She's been on TV in Seinfeld, New Heart, uh, Night Court, and The Nanny. 
She's had recurring roles in Sidekicks and Webster. She's been on the soaps. She's been in Movies of the Week. <laughs> and we haven't even gotten to the stage where she's done so much work. Magda, coming from a film, I mean, from an acting family, not a film family, but an acting family that was compared to the Barrymores, what would go on in your mind? Explain this family background. Well, it was always such a natural thing for me. Yeah, you didn't have a chance, did no, you? I didn't have a chance to, to even do anything or think of anything else. I remember as a child, I used to be under the table and they would have, have rehearsals in the house. You know, and because the family was large, as uh, not in numbers, but as far as acting was concerned, <laughs> it was my grandfather, grandmother, uh, two uncles, an aunt, my mother and dad. So that was quite a, a large. That was group. the company, or that, that was the company. And what was it called? It was called the Antronic Dramatic Company. And Antronik, of course, was an Armenian king. king. He was a king. He chose a good... And who was Antronik? <laughs> was my grandfather. Oh, was your grandfather? <laughs> he actually was king you know, of his domain. But uh, they started out in Russia, in Armenia, and came here. And uh, traveled through the States. And when I was born in Detroit, I was... Uh, well, I was an infant when we came here to California. But uh, my dad... Uh, was in the movies at that time. Oh, he was also. Yes. So he was in the film. So when they yes. compare them, you, they had film work yes. and, theater, and work theater work and, and um, on the road. On the road, they went on tour. Well, they went on tour and didn't come back. Let's put it that way. That it, right? was at that, it was at that time of history when there was the Turkish problem on Oh, you mean side. he left Russia and went on they, tour? <laughs> they left Russia and went on tour and didn't come back. They went all throughout the States and, and uh, ended up in California in the, where the movie industry was, which is what they wanted. Oh, they had planned yes, that? Oh, they had planned that, the, whole, the entire family. And, but uh, and besides that, as actors know nowadays, you have to have something else on the side. <laughs> so to live, you mean? To live and raise, <laughs> raise a large family. And he went into the restaurant business. Uh, Omar Khayyam's was a famous uh, San Francisco restaurant at that time. And uh, he was there for a while and opened Did a restaurant he work? here. He, he, he was made to D there for at, a at couple the, of years. At Omar Khayyam in at San Omar, Francisco. In San Francisco. So is that when he learned the restaurant That's business? That's where he learned the restaurant business. Plus all the Armenian cooking that went on at home. But that's where he learned the business. So then you moved to Los Angeles? Los Angeles, and uh, he opened the Har Omar restaurant. And so tell us, uh, well, tell us how that name came about, because it was H-A-R dash. H-A-R, H-A-R, the first part of Harut, and Omar, uh, following Omar Khayyam, because we had paintings of Omar Khayyam all over the walls, which my mother did, by the way. I she was see. quite a wonderful painter. Well, how did this family <laughs> all live together? Were they, were they compatible? Oh, sometimes, but they were always arguing about the roles and this direction and we should do it this way and that way. But my grandparents, for instance, always lived with us. But, so and what I, about the costuming? Did they do that as oh, well? Oh, yes, they did all costuming. The sets were, of course, rented or built. Because, uh, he built the Ivar Theater in Hollywood. Well, that was a very famous theater in the 40s, Right, it? right. The opening, I think they were planning uh, 1949 or 1950 opening. That's when it opened. And why did he build that theater? Just for his productions or for everything? For everything. He was an actor and that was in his soul. He was an actor first and foremost. And uh, he built the theater for to lease out, but also leaving a space of time where the family could perform. It was and wonderful. what kind of performances did you do? Were they in the English language? Not his, not uh, the Antoni group. They were in Armenian. Oh, they were. Yes, but, but when the theater was leased out, it was all all kinds of. We had stars coming there. But but uh, but that whole company did their work in Armenian. Yes. Always. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. I didn't realize that. Yes. So, there was so a, who was your audience? <laughs> Armenians. You know, there weren't that many Armenians at that time, which is amazing, really. Uh, when the family traveled, you know, when they landed in New York and traveled down to California, wherever there was an Armenian community, there was a performance of well, the would, classics. They would perform along the way. Kind of uh, like the circus, in a way, exactly, right? Exactly, exactly like the Apple Circus, right? <laughs> <laughs> Only they did serious work. And wherever there was a community, that's where they performed. And at that time in Los Angeles, it was a very small community. Now it's overwhelming. 
But did they the have just, did, did other, other people must have come to see it because his renown and, and then opening the restaurant, your father oh, yes. had so many celebrities coming to the restaurant yes, that yes. they must have come to see the... Uh, Akim Tamarev came all the time, I remember. But he spoke <laughs> Russian, probably. Russian and Armenian. Oh, he did? He's Armenian. Everyone thinks he's Russian. I he, was an Ar he was a Russian Armenian, born in Russia, but in Armenia. Tamara. Yeah. Oh, I didn't okay. know that. Yeah, very interesting. We had some very interesting people come to the restaurant, all the stars and everything. And I know. think the great thing is that that was founded where the old Spago was. Spago on the Sunset Strip, yes, wasn't that yes, it? Yes, yes. First it was in Hollywood? Well, first the restaurant was in Hollywood on Ivar, and next, oh, next door the was the theater. And then the restaurant went up on uh, Sunset. Sunset Strip. And then it went to Spago's. Oh, so I see. So he had his theater and he had his restaurant yes, and he yes. had people, his celebrities coming, people right. coming, and then they'd go to the, the theater. Yeah, so he had the it all planned oh, out. Yeah. He had it all planned out. And the bar did a very good business at that time, too. Is and that after the theater. After the theater and during intermission. So it was it was quite an experience. And so well, I've, let's get back to you now. I've so never known anything else but acting. You didn't have a chance, as I said before, but you've gotten so many major awards, and most of your awards have come from being on the stage as yes. an actress. Yes. Uh, you did Nine Armenians at the Taper. and yeah. so I just finished Kiss at City Hall at Pasadena Playhouse. But then I did a lot of plays uh, you did around Ma town. Mad Woman of Shio. Yes, Mad Woman of Shio, the Giroudou play, and uh, Tennessee Williams, you know, the milk train doesn't stop here anymore. Uh, I mean, so many. Uh, what type of roles? Are, do you have a, a niche that you fall in? I would rather not fall into a niche. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, True. but I've, I've done everything from the, the classics to comedies. I've done a, uh, TV work is mostly comedies that I've done. Some serious roles are mostly comedies and commercials, but theatrically I've done I've run the gamut, actually. Do they ask about your language specialty? I mean, always, is that part of it? Always. Now that uh, my hair is uh, not black, I'm not in that oh, niche any. That changed. Foreign. It changed my career completely, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's an interesting point. Because when point. they see a dark-haired, dark-eyed person, they think of you as being ethnic, period. And yeah. you could play any role, then, as oh. an ethnic, uh, dark-haired, dark-eyed person. Absolutely. And, and now uh, that you're blonde? If I, even more roles. Even more roles because well, that, you are categorized that way. The, the one role, though, that I saw, Kiss uh, at City, at Hall. City Hall, was an Italian. Italian, right. So do you yeah. have to go to a dialogue coach or do you do it yourself? No, uh, I do it myself and have done it. I studied with uh, Marie Uspensky at the Moscow Arts Theater. And uh, we had a phonetics teacher, mm -hmm. very famous at the time, Margaret Mid uh, Pendergast McLean. And I took phonetics for three years. So I can pick up. So I can you, do any language. <laughs> so you listen to the you, you listen to the rhythm of it. And yes, then pick and it I up. can translate it phonetically, so well, that I speak Russian and Armenian and French and any dialect you you know. From um, that. From that. The um, one of the things that you did that I thought was very interesting was you had this exchange program. Um, oh, in Russia. Was it to Russia? Yes, yes. There, at that time, there was a uh, cultural exchange program. Uh, for Armenia, and I went there, and uh, I stayed for a year. You actually... I was lived there for a year as the, my status was a temporary citizen. Really? Really. But it was when Russia, when it was the Republic. Yes. Uh, Armenia was still part of the yes. Soviet Union. Yes, so I had to pass all sorts of investigations and so on. And then on. you went down to then Armenia. I went, I went there, and I, I was supposed to be there for six months, then they asked me to stay longer. Did they send I, people here? Yes, in exchange? they did. Yes. Well, how did that well, work? They, well, they, well, that worked uh, as far as the universities were concerned. But in legit theater, they didn't have that, men that many at that time. Now there are many uh, troops that come over. Oh, the dancers from Moscow and then the... Uh, um, opera. They, they have the opera. So now it's it's uh, not even called an exchange. They just come over and go back I see. But were, were you supposed to be there to act? Yes. So you were acting. Yes. I see. You weren't teaching. No, no. Or no, workshopping. I was, no, or, no. Uh, I was acting professionally. And there's a big difference. Everyone <laughs> asks me, what is the difference? Well, the only difference over there, theatrically, was that an actor, there was only one union. You did TV and movies and uh, went on tour and did radio. And an actor did everything. 
So but at that time, the time you were there, you must have been treated very, very lavishly, really, because the Russians thought so much of their uh, cultural programs. Yes, yes, they did. I mean, they and must have respected you as an actress, is I what was I'm treated saying. royally, may I say, royally. And plus the fact that I was born here, mm -hmm. but uh, knew the language there, both Armenian and Russian. Awesome. So that made a big difference so that uh, the appearances were both in Armenian and Russian and English. And English. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, they did the, I did the price there. To, uh, oh. Yeah. And did so, they understand? Oh, yes, absolutely. It was a very good translation, actually. The, um, I think one of the things, people are going to be watching you, and they're going to say, where have I seen that face? Where have I seen that <laughs> face? And I think those, those commercials that you did, the heavenly commercial. Oh, my angel, yeah, angel. Tell, I mean, do that, because it's like you were so Hello? Sad. No. no. <laughs> Hello? The, the funniest part of those commercials were the outtakes, because some of them were hilarious. No, that was a very, I thought it was a very good commercial. I thought it was yeah, great, it and it was forever. on all the time. And yeah. you would always say, there's Magda, there <laughs> yes, she is. Yes. And so there was another one, too. Um, that people always remember. Oh, I've done so many. Let's see. Which one could that have been? Maybe it was the Maritech or maybe it was Apoyo Loco. Apoyo Loco. <laughs> what did you do with that one? <laughs> I danced a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and all the, you know, the telephone companies and all that. Uh, so uh, commercials, you have a chance to really change the way you look and uh, different accents and different locales. And so it's, sometimes it's not recognizable. <laughs> they were to me. <laughs> when... Um, one really special thing at the Haromar, what was one special dish that your father used to make? Oh, my goodness. I back think, to food. Back to food. <laughs> oh, yes, we're in that, aren't we? Uh, his favorite was chaho belly, which is chicken. And it's also a, uh, uh, an Iranian dish, and it's also a Russian dish. And it's made with chicken and tomatoes and... Uh, sautéed and so on with his very special dressings and that was his favorite and he used to cook it himself. He, he would actually cook yes. at the restaurant? Yes. The men in our family cooked. You know, my grandfather, I remember my grandfather cooking and my uncles cooking. And my dad cooked. Not all the time after a while but that was his specialty and his favorite. And he had a very special salad, the Haromar spinach salad. Oh, which that... was, spinach salad was not very popular in no, the 50s. I... <laughs> <laughs> no, he made that very popular, spinach salad. And, and of course, I remember going there as a child, young. I mean, I remember going there. Mm -hmm. And he would come and sit at the table and, and talk to you. And well, that's like it where, was his living room. Well, that's where the actor took over. He just loved coming <laughs> around and talking to people. And, and uh, he, was, uh, he was very friendly and open. And he loved that. He just loved knowing everybody and talking to them. Well, do we have anyone else in the following in the footsteps of the Antranig, <laughs> Antranig, Antranig company? Unfortunately, no. I'm the last. You're the last. The that last. Your children are not? No, they're not interested at all. No, not at all. Uh, I'm glad in a way and I'm sad in a way because there's so many ups and downs and so many joys, but acting is not a, uh, an easy profession. Well, you've so made it seem very easy. You've done great. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you for being with us thank today, you. Magda. Thank Harry. you for having me. Don't, uh, you can go away, but keep writing. Don't forget to write. Uh, 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor. See you next time on the Joan Quinn Profile.